Welcome to another episode of Mining Now. Today we are featuring TerraSource Global and here to talk about how they lead in innovative, durable and cost effective solutions for crushing, moving and processing raw materials is Matt Richardson. But before we can continue with this episode, let's thank our sponsors. First up, we have Nalco Water. Nalco Water, an Ecolab company, is the leading global provider of water management solutions and expertise. Their solutions maximize operating performance and minimize water and energy use for industrial and institutional customers, including mining and mineral processing companies. Nalco Water provides a variety of solutions, including boiler and cooling tower treatment, flotation, material handling, scale control, dust control, tailings management, and much, much more. To learn more, more, visit them at ecolab.com forward slash Nalco Water. And also, we are actually featuring Nalco Water on our next episode of Mining Now, so definitely check that out. Next up, we have CIM. CIM is the leading membership organization for technical content and creating connections in the mining industry. Mining professionals and students can access a breadth of technical expertise through the CIM Technical Paper Library, the OneMind Digital Repository, the CIM Journal, the CIM Magazine, and also attend upcoming CIM webinars. Whether you're working in the field, in the office, or at home, join the community today and learn how they can help you achieve your professional goals. You can visit them at cim.org. And we also have Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world, from placer to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at savanaequipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. And last but not least, we have PowerZone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. Well, let's get on with this episode. Here is Matt Richardson and Jared Downey. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Jared Downey, and this is Mining Now. My guest today is Matt Richardson. He is the, make, make sure I get this right, the, uh, oh, I lost it, Senior Director of Engineering and Innovation at TerraSource. How are you today, Matt? I'm great. Thank you. Good. Um, it's it's good to have you on the show. TerraSource is an, an interesting company. They've got all the products that essentially I grew up um, doing the used version of those products. So uh, it's, I, I always like it when we've got the heavy duty equipment on. Um, first, I got to say, that's the uh, what is the arch in the background? Everybody's going to know but me, uh, and I should have known. <laughs> so yeah, that is the gateway to the west. Um, it's a national park back behind us. We've got pretty good view. Off to the other side, you can't see it. We've got the Eads Bridge, which was a uh, first bridge to cross the Mississippi too. It's a nice, so, nice little spot we've got. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I want to do that quick thing with, with TerraSource. Just a lot of people, especially because this is primarily the mining show, a lot of people are going to be familiar with it. But let's just do that quick rundown so that people know the, the equipment that you guys do supply. Yeah, so we uh, encompass everything in terms of our uh, goal to help power feed and build the world. You break that down, it ends up being equipment that either reduces in size, crushes, conveys, or uh, processes, which could be screening or a number of different types of activities. Uh, in the mining and the minerals world, uh, it really comes down to crushing and uh, feeding primarily. And then when you get into that, it, it covers a pretty vast array uh, when you consider all three of our brands, everything from hammer mills, roll crushers, impactors, um, yeah, from really small to really large, uh, run of mine to processing facilities. When you said when you say in mining, though, so you're you're servicing mul multiple sectors. Of course, it's a mining show, but but just to clarify, yeah, I would say uh, mining. Call it roughly half of our business. The other half is in forest products. We service just about every pulp and paper mill in the world. Uh, a lot of general industrial, fiberglass, rubber. Uh, you know, taking a lot of the raw materials you're taking out of mining, and then uh, you know the places that are getting processed. Uh, we then have equipment as well and work with those customers. Yeah, the there's a term that comes up um, 
pain points. Uh, we've, we've talked about it off the air. Um, is that, is that, and I want to review some of those because it's, it's, it's really what you're, you're trying to provide for customers is, is eliminating some of these pain points. Um, are the, are they pretty consistent across industry? Like what people are looking for, like higher productivity and, you know, less downtime and those types of things. Is that, is that a pretty consistent thing or is it enhanced even more so in mining? Uh, some definitely are more enhanced in mining. Uh, so one big one that we've seen even ourselves, but across all of our customers is skilled labor. Uh, just the inability to find them both at a technician level and even at, you know, some of the superintendent supervisor levels at the mill. Uh, they just can't get people that want to get into those fields. In some cases, just get their hands dirty. It's something I've always loved doing, but, uh, uh, that's common across the forestry side, the mining side. When you get to general industrial, maybe a little less because uh, those are located a little bit closer to some big cities. You got a bigger pool of people. Uh, but in terms of trying to improve efficiency, increase yields out of the existing equipment, you know, minimizing investment costs while still being able to squeeze out more productivity, uh, that is most definitely common across the board. And we have those discussions uh, with all the customers. But uh, you talk to people like Georgia Pacific, who bridges, you know, mining from a gypsum side to, you know, pulp and paper. Yeah, when we talk to their corporate office, um, it, it's a common conversation, skilled labor, and then how do you help us operate this with less people and a lot more efficiency, efficiently. It's funny that it's these things that are so obvious and you don't think about them till you hear, hear them. As I always, I, I think of like, yeah, the pulp and paper side of things is those those infrastructure is usually within sort of the uh, closer to a city or at least a town, whereas a mine is going to be so remote. And of course that's going to, you can earn a similar living without having to do that long commute or be in those 10 ons four off, you know, all those types of shifts. So um, in, in mining that increasing productivity, and I'm always, when you talk about that, when you're bringing your products in, is it, are you trying to increase, are these, are the mines trying to increase by 30% or are they, you know, are these incremental increases that just increase that efficiency, that just that little bit extra for their, you know, for their quarterly earnings type thing? No, I mean, I'm sure if we asked them, they'd say, yeah, 30%, that's great. But no, we're in very mature, you know, industries, you, you get new mines every once in a while, but for the most part, you're dealing with a mine that may have been there for 50, 60, hundred years. Uh, so no, incremental 5% is a big increase, um, either in uh, output or maybe it's in reduced power input, reduced uh, waste. It's expensive and then it's just wasted products. So yeah, we usually look two, three, 5% is kind of the range that we're working with uh, as you know, a big win and easy to justify projects around. How successful has TerraSource been? I mean, mine shutdown is obviously, I mean, that it, it's, if it really has to shut down, of course, that's catastrophic to the bottom line, but, but just general maintenance and that, how, how successful has TerraSource been in, in eliminating that as a pain point? Because obviously that's a major, major thing. And, and of course, as soon as you're shutting down, now you're having skilled training, having to go in and, and do more work on things. So has that been, has that been a major focus? Uh, for sure. And uh, I mean, the key is uh, avoiding unscheduled shutdown first. Uh, obviously, they want to extend time between shutdowns in general. You know, once upon a time, it was every six months. I don't know of anybody running that anymore. You know, it's at least annual and there's parts of, you know, a mine that they want to go a year and a half, two years uh, without having to really take that offline. Uh, so that really leads to a lot of our innovation around wear materials uh, you try to holistically look at it. Okay, you know, these are the three primary areas of where we need to advance the alloys we use there. Uh, we need to, you know, make sure that we've got monitoring in place around bearings and things like that. So that, uh, you know, even if they were forgotten and not well maintained in the past, at six months, you can inspect them and do a replacement. But once you're talking about going two years on a really piece of heavy duty equipment that has rocks and dusts all around it. Uh, two years is really starting to push not just wear components, but your primary structural components as well. Um, so what we do is really sit down with the customer and, and try to understand that. And we use, you know, a lot of tools that 
around lean and six sigma to okay if you want to go two years what does that mean well that means the hammers and the the wear liners need to but also you know the bearings what type of life have we been getting out of those try to break down the individual components we need to look at to really make that happen for a customer it's something i always um and, and of course I, I believe you're you're an engineer is that is that right that's true yeah so so you have a, a, an understanding of those mechanics better than i do and i've always I, and i hope you can explain it to me and i'm not asking too technical of a question I've always had a, a, a tough time understanding how, let's say a bearing, that's a good example. So the mechanics of a machine, I mean, we've had pump customers on here. The mechanics are really quite similar that they were 30 years ago. So how do you take something like a bearing that says, okay, it used to sh the whole thing used to shut down for six months and then that's an opportunity for us to adjust things like the bearings. Now the customer needs it to last a year or 18 months or 24 months. What adjustments is it? Is it just the material? Like, how do you actually make that possible in a mechanical thing that's pretty much a similar design that it was 20 years ago? Yeah. So, uh, so let's roll back. When we design it, we're not designing anything like this to only last two years. And we have a lot of pieces of equipment that they've been running the same shaft for 20 years. Right. If you have the right environment and you protect those components and maintain them properly, they last a long time. Uh, what we see is that in mining, you don't often get to run in ideal conditions. So where by design, this thing can last 10, 20 years. Uh, we see that a little bitty piece of, you know, stone or dust gets in, ingresses into those bearings. Then where you have these ultra smooth ground metal surfaces with nice lubricating grease, now there's a bunch of grit in there and that then rapidly, rapidly decays it. So in that sense, sealing ends up being one of the biggest areas of improvement, both on the housing of the equipment, so keep the material in where it's supposed to be, and if it does get out, well, let's protect the bearings and get it away from that and let it go wear something or just, you know, make a housekeeping issue instead of possibly taking a piece of equipment down. Um, and then in the worst cases, if you can't design around all of that, then you just put monitoring devices in place. If you're monitoring vibration, temperature, you can usually see things months in advance, at least weeks, instead of um, your motor trips out because it goes over amps and you're hard down and you were supposed to, you know, hit a certain production number by, you know, the next day. And that's when it really is the biggest impact on our customers. How much does the, these monitoring sister, uh, systems, Matt, how, how much does that, um, when you talk about uh, skilled labor shortages, um, how much of an advance or how much of a difference has that actually made when you have these, you know, monitoring system, autonomous systems, these, these things that are now essentially becoming standard in these established mines. Has, has it allowed for mines to hire people without that same level of experience? Has it, has it, have you noticed the difference or is it sort of like um, slowly going that direction, but there's still sort of, that, there's that need for those, for those people that have that skill training. Yeah, I think there's a lot of variation. So the key is you could put instruments on and you can have a signal come out, but if, if you don't know how anybody to in, have anybody that knows how to interpret it, it's not of a lot of use. Um, so right. that gets into uh, the OEMs. They're asking, they kind of want a nice clean dashboard uh, that just has an alarm that pops up. Uh, and that's what we're actually working on now. When you look at kind of the heavy industrial uh, stationary equipment, there's not a lot out there that is to where, say, like, you know, a tractor or the off-highway, you know, movable equipment that they're using for heavy haul trucks. That's a lot further along. It came from John Deere. Totally different, you know, level of progress. Um, so while we can instrument it, the key is presenting useful data for them to be able to action. Uh, just saying the temperature is this, and a month ago it was this. Maybe that means you're about to have a catastrophic failure. Maybe it means that it's summer now and it was winter, you know, four months ago, uh, and it's not a big deal at all. Uh, right. So, yeah, instruments, very cheap and easy, uh, you know, very robust. We don't have issues with vibration. They're just very bulletproof, but it's really taking that and being able to consolidate it into useful information for the OEM, um, but then for sure for the customer and know what it means and how they, how they use it. The, the other thing there, there's a few things I, I'm, 
and, and I'm not just saying when I, I I'm very glad to have because we we've had a lot of technology companies on or like they're they they may have hardware but they're sort of they come from the technology uh, starting point and then build around the hardware where your where TerraSource is a hardware company they build the product and now they're adding on so and I always like that side um, just just from my background and um, how much of what you're doing is like how much are you having to adapt on it, even on an annual basis, uh, as the technology advances, the whole life cycle of the mine, the whole system that you're you're integrating your equipment in? How much feedback are you continually getting? Um, it, I mean, there is there is there still a world of plug and play, or are you continually adapting and upgrading now um, to integrate into these systems? Yeah, uh, we don't see a lot of plug and play where. Uh, how we're designing ours is that it can actually were designed, uh, it has been designed so that customer doesn't even have to know about it. Now it requires a cellular uplink um, so that we can get the data and in the mines, everybody knows like that may or may not be available. So there's also, you know, on-site storage, you know, where you can plug in a thumb drive and maybe just pull it every month. But either way, uh, once you start feeding into the tentacles that are the uh, local control system, uh, it gets very custom quick. So we usually set it up so that there's certain inputs and outputs available um, that they can tie into and then leave that to, you know, localized uh, contractors that have more control over the entire plant. Um, but yeah, you know, again, like you look at, you know, the heavy haul trucks that they're using, the, the big loaders, those are a, a contained entity. Um, yeah. there is then remote control of those as well, but it's always usually a proprietary, um, system that you're monitoring and you kind of just have all that brands. Once you start getting into the main process flow of stationary equipment, you've got somebody's conveyor or somebody's screen feeding our crusher, and then it might go to somebody else's screen and then back to our crusher. And, uh, it requires a lot of interaction and uh, integration with the customer. Yeah, it's it, it's actually. Um, I mean, we we couldn't do enough shows to dissect all of it because I mean, every mine is different. I mean, I've I've had shows where I've tried to kind of unpack it with people, and it just ends up you're like, okay, well, I need about another fifty shows because the more you know, the more complicated it gets. Yeah, from what I found is that uh, it's very much you'll get uh, a pretty progressive uh, mine manager, or somebody at site that really knows the technology, and you'll see a mine really take some big strides. Uh, and then, you know, stand out. That's kind of the case with one of our uh, customers that's, uh, we have in Potash that is just always trying to push the limits and do things new. Um, but yeah, I, we find it's very customer centric for us. When you have a customer like that, though, that do they, um, is the, What's the success rate? I, I don't mean in numbers, but when you have someone that sort of gets that technology and they say, okay, I'm going to, I mean, another pain point that we talk about um, is minimizing waste. Obviously that's a huge goal. And so I, I'd like you to touch on that. But when, when you have that sort of progressive manager in place, um, does it really open the door to make these two or 3% gains? Definitely. So uh, the one I'm talking about is uh, it's a potash producer out in Utah that we've worked with for a number of years. You know, they've really been on the front edge of a lot of the uh, equipment evolutions we've made around potash for sure. Uh, you know, all of our big customers up in uh, Saskatchewan as well. And then even, you know, the Russia customers do things a little different, but in general, it's been great working with uh, this customer because we get a lot of feedback and they've got a lot of instrumentation and data, as you said, um, I guess I'll start with the story. So we we're in a mine expo, uh, whenever the last one was, and we were sitting there at dinner with this customer and their mine went down. So we're there at dinner, hanging out, having some drinks and, uh, the operation went down. He gets on his phone. He's sitting there like literally talking with him. It happened to have our piece of equipment involved. We were looking at, you know, bearing temperatures. We were looking at how many amps it was pulling and troubleshot it, called the guy back and got it back up and running, you know, and went on with dinner. So, you know, that's kind of a, just a fun story, but it is real. Like, uh, you know, we're so busy now to have, you know, that expertise available, even though you're not at sites is pretty uh, important. Uh, the most recent one that 
provided some really big improvements for them. Uh, this was on the ore side. So they have big ponds that they're pulling off a slurry. You got to pump it miles and miles to the processing plants. Uh, there's some screens that always had issues, always plugging, you're trying to wet screen. And then they had this old hammer mill that tried to crush it, but it really didn't provide a fine grind. So you're taking out pumps because of how much wear. Uh, and so we used uh, our nano sizer, they actually redesigned our nano sizer, which was designed for uh, dry limestone and salts and uh, materials like that to be able to process the wet material. It got rid of the screen, which is always a pain, especially when you have wet product and uh, was able to take such a fine product that the rebuild on those pumps, you know, basically went to align with that annual cycle where it was having to get taken down and worked on. So that's one where I'd have to go and look, that was definitely more than a 5%, you know, cost improvement because your downtime got eliminated for that, you know, semi-annual shutdown. And then uh, just the in general, the, the maintenance parts uh, on the pump and the screen, I don't remember the totals, but uh, that was definitely when that was realized. That, that, that product is a good example of what I was referring to earlier. Something like that, where it is, it's actually a fairly major shift for, for in production. Do you just have to have someone that's on board with having the conversation or, or could, uh, let, let, let's say if you talk to 10 mines that had that same system that was, you know, the screens were clogging and things like that. If you talk to 10 different types of managers, would nine, if you introduced this new system, would they go for it or would it be like three, if you were to guess? So they all say, you know, who else is using this? Where, where's it at? Can I call them? Can I, can I go see it? hundred percent. I mean, that's just the industry we're in. Like everything we do is we've been building the same piece of equipment for many, many years. But if you go and look at how often we built that piece of equipment, exactly the same, it's not very often. Uh, so those are the, it always starts with that. Who else is doing it? And then it's kind of easy. You know, now that we've done it once and it's really successful, it's pretty easy right. to go and convince others. So it's that one. And sometimes there's not that one. You got to kind of wait, you know, for some changeover to say, yeah, uh, I think that'll work. And it's not just somebody that kind of likes trying new things. We know our equipment really, really well. We actually know our customers' industries really well. They lean on us for some of that institutional knowledge to some degree. But when you partner with somebody that really knows their operation well and knows our equipment from a different perspective, that's when it gets really fun. We have a test center, which make it, you know, sometimes we can test it and uh, provide that level of assurance. But it, it seems like our biggest leaps happen when we've got a, a, an innovative customer that really has a deep understanding of their operation and how our, our equipment fits in. And then uh, we've got a pretty, you know, basically the complimentary view um, from our side. Yeah, I remember we went down to, uh, it was a power gen show in Orlando, Florida, and we were just starting out our company. And we thought the reason that people sort of weren't listening to us, some of the stuff that we want to do, like, you know, this show and that, um, was because we were a small company and all that. And then I remember distinctly going to the GE booth, which is this massive booth. They had these, you know, VR headsets you could put on and walk down a whole power. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. And the guy there, one of the head, uh, uh, like sales guys or something there, um, he said, the major problem we have is that a guy's already built three mills and we go talk to him. He's like, well, let's work the other three. And I remember Rory and I walked away going, if GE is having that trouble. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like what we're just the same we, we, you know we're three people there whatever but it's the same challenge and i it, it must be the same for you you have these systems that have been in place and it gets the job done but so that five percent is it worth the risk i guess that's always the the balance yeah and i mean you know when you're talking about totally new you can get more than five percent a lot of times that five percent is just let's tweak it let's change the configuration of a piece of equipment we don't even take it out but uh, you really hit on a big point is, you know, you don't get in trouble for doing it the same way. Um, but if you go out on a limb and take a bet and it doesn't work, you know, that's, that's where the risk is. Um, um, yeah. And in established industries where things have been getting done the same way, so to speak, for a long time, it really does, um, you know, take us stepping up and, you know, partnering with somebody to give them the level of comfort and then them having the comfort that we're going to stick to it. Like if for some reason we need to tweak it, that's fine. Everybody's totally open to that, but they need to trust that we're going to stick around and, you know, be willing to reconfigure the machine or whatever's necessary to uh, get them operating the way they need. 
I want to talk a little bit, just, just, I don't, I don't want to get too far away from the mining stream, but I mean, you've done some work in, in raw petroleum, which, I mean, we have another show called Crownsman Energy. So we've of course got a large petroleum audience as well. And I want to talk a little bit because it involved, um, it's sort of that, uh, it involves sort of understanding that downstream process, which is another fascinating thing that, that your system is what it's doing is leading into a, a whole ecosystem. So can you highlight one of those projects? Because I, I do think it's important to sort of give that context of, of what other things TerraSource is doing. Yeah, we do a lot of work up in the oil sands, which is kind of the mining part of the oil energy sector, um, pretty aggressive one. So we, we're always working with, you know, the major players up there. And that's just such an aggressive environment. Uh, our most advanced alloys, we're always trying to figure out and test our most advanced alloys to stretch them a little longer. Um, uh, to this day, right now, even though they're kind of in a hard spot, um, just with oil prices the way they are, you know, all the more they're trying to reduce their operating expense. And so uh, we're working with different metallurgy, different, you know, metal matrix composites that's literally using ceramics embedded in metal, of which there's tons of different types. Uh, but yeah, so the end product is crude that you're sending down, you know, if you're up in Alberta, it's literally going south to uh, Edmonton, maybe Calgary. Um, and then uh, we're involved at the refineries as well. Uh, some of it is as simple as the coking area, which is kind of, you know, the dirty separate area that uh, is producing pure, pure uh, petroleum coke, which then goes on to other customers, you know, those in the aluminum industry, they make carbon anodes out of it for the smelting. Um, but then we also have products that are involved in some of the more advanced refining for like polyethylene, polypropylene uh, in that process. So some of just the, the benefit of being involved in all those is you understand some of the pressures downstream and what they're getting and knowing that that's going to just flow right upstream. If they're under economic pressures at the refinery, um, that means they're going to be asking more for, um, uh, you know, the mines up in the oil sands uh, in terms of what they're producing or just in general, you'll see that some of the new certifications around uh, explosion protection and requirements around instrumentation uh, usually starts at places like a refinery and then starts spreading out into other industries and adjacencies. Um, some of it's just, uh, you know, we're, we're crushing baking soda and that's going in literally at the mine side and then that's going into, you know, more of a, a materials or a ag lime going into feed, uh, processing plants what how uh, through talking all this i'm curious <laughs> how often do you just get an order <laughs> like like someone just phones and say hey i'm on your website i need that <laughs> can you <laughs> does it ever happen so that happens but that just that starts a conversation right you know now uh, we replace equipment all the time so we do be like hey i need another of this Right. That's fantastic. Right. Except that between, you know, 25 years ago when we first built it and now, oh, by the way, there's now all these government regulations. So I know that one was operating just fine, but now it needs to meet these explosion proof classifications. Like, okay, well that we got to redesign the machine to do that then. Um, so we do have those. Not a lot of them are easy. Just here's the order. Usually it's, Hey, um, you know, I saw this on your website. That looks awesome. I want to do this. And they've got some grand, you know, you've got one of those dreamers that thinks like, oh, I'm going to put this piece of equipment in and it's going to, you know, 25% productivity improvement, or I can get rid of that big ball mill that I hate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it usually starts the conversation. We say, all right, well, you know, what are you needing to do? We get into a lot of depth around what are you feeding it? What's the product like? We might test it. Uh, and usually you end up somewhere in between. Maybe you can't get rid of that ball mill, but we can put in a cage factor that you know, does a lot of the work and then you improve your, you know, efficiency to reduce a lot of the wear in your ball mill. And, uh, you know, you net out 10%, which is huge in this world, uh, you know, in the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, I, I, I kind of knew the answer to the question before I asked it, but I thought I'd, uh, I'll, I'll just double check. Um, I want to talk about some of the brands, Matt, because you've got, um, I mean, uh, Gundlach, Jeffrey Raider, um, and Pennsylvania Crushers. I mean, those are all three, um, I mean, they're premium brands. Um, can you, can you talk about them? And I wanted to clarify because I actually thought over time it was these, it's very common in the mining industry. You'll see brands sort of, um, 
they gather up brands as the company grows. But that's actually not what TerraSource has done, right? They, did they start with these brands or how did that all come together? So TerraSource, the brands were together and then we formed TerraSource to be the, the overarching company while maintaining those brands. Uh, for sure, uh, if you look at the legacy, Pennsylvania Crusher was started in 1905. Jeffrey Specialty, much later became Jeffrey Raider, was 1896, I think, and Gunlock Equipment Corporation was uh, mid-1920s. So a really, really long legacy. And in many cases, we've got not that long, but we've got people celebrating 30, 40, five years with the company. So uh, that's the biggest thing that people say, well, who's TerraSource? You know, I thought you guys were just, you know, repping these brands. No, we are very much these brands. You know, the legacy knowledge and institutional knowledge is here. Uh, we just said, all right, um, we don't want to compete against each other, uh, which we once did a long time ago as these brands. We have a holistic view. We know, you know, where a piece of Pennsylvania Crusher equipment is going to fit better or a Jeffrey Rader piece will be better. Um, so that is what TerraSource is. And it's Terra, so it's sourcing from the earth. Pretty simple. That's that's the business we're in. Um, so yeah, today, like we'll go into a lot of operations. They have all three brands there. Um, and before we kind of went through the effort of combining and structuring ourselves to support these brands as a single company, you'd almost be competing. You might have two sales guys wanting to make the same sale where now we really focus on supplying solutions, understanding what do you need using what's become a pretty vast array of options and equipment to uh, determine the best partner to figure out what the best solution is. Which for a customer, that must be, I mean, if I'm, if I'm buying, you know, potentially spending uh, thousands and thousands or millions on, on equipment upgrades and SWAT and all that. I mean, I want, if someone's got three brands, I want to know that they're going to put the, they're going to put the product that's best. They're not going to sort of, um, for lack of a better word, manipulate the process to, to push this specific product. Right. Right. Yeah, our, we almost get into the opposite where a customer's like, no, I want an impactor. Like, all well, right. Yeah. Like, by the way, like a roll crusher, like I can actually give you this. It's around the same price. It's going to really reduce the amount of fines. Like, no, I want an impactor. All right, let's do some testing. Oh, by the way, send an extra barrel of material. I'm going to put it through a roll crusher. If you want an impactor, I'll sell it to you. But like, let me at least show you like what the product curve differences will be. And so it's almost, you know, I have to talk down an engineer, be like, I know. I know it feels like the roll crusher is better, but they've got like six other machines that are just like this one. There's a lot of other reasons than just optimal, you know, performance that they might want. Common spare parts, just the uh, training. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on. And so you end up with conversations more like that now than it used to be like, uh, you think we can sell this piece of equipment to do that? What's well, the only one we got? Sure, let's try. Right, yeah. That's a huge difference. I mean, that's uh, I'm, yeah. glad we, I'm glad we touched on that because it's, it's actually quite an important thing. It, it's something I actively think about when I'm going to purchase something is if, if I see if I see that a company has multiple brands, I go, OK, I'm going to I'm probably going to get the right one because they're going to slide me into the right slot as opposed to, OK, this is the only I mean, we see it with production equipment, right? It's that's yep. on our side. I want to quickly um, go over all three of the brands. Again, a lot of people in the industry will know. But but since but since you're here, um, mm -hmm. the uh, let's start with Gunlatch. What uh, what is their primary uh, product? So primary Gunlock product? has been uh, really on the mining side, and it's purely crushing equipment. Uh, the cage factor and the roll crushers are the two most well known uh, pieces. So the roll crushers, there's a lot of different types of crushers that have rolls, sizers, grinding mills. Uh, I'd say where Gunlock has really uh, carved out a strong, I was going to say niche, but it's really much larger than that, is specialty crushing. There's a huge array of different roll configurations and where normally people aren't using roll crushers below like an inch, uh, we're taking it down to, you know, six millimeters, two millimeters in some cases. Uh, and then we've even evolved past that to things like the nano sizer, which has rolls, but uh, it, it's really getting into a specialty type of grinding mill. Uh, the cage factor is uh, really just a unique piece of equipment that falls, you know, somewhere between a hammer mill, but it has a lot uh, fewer fines generation, a lot better product curves, but uh, which you get out of an impactor, but it's got a lot better control. So you end up being able to provide a very fine material very consistently without needing to 
uh, you know, put a screen in or end up with a lot of material you don't want. Um, yeah, like Pennsylvania Crusher has been uh, impactors, hammer mills, sizers, uh, a lot of your core pieces of equipment, and they've always been uh, what I would say high spec. They've got extra features that allow adjustments and uh, capability, really high capacities. Uh, we get into some uh, other products with them around our jaw crushers and the uh, positive flow feeders. Uh, they've really been, you know, robust but high spec and capability. Uh, and then, you know, from a mining perspective, you get into use the term Jeffrey because Jeffrey's a company, Jeffrey Raider, Raider, and and then merged. Uh, you know, in terms of the vast history of the brand, somewhat recently, but uh, Jeffrey's really the name that's known in the mining world, and they are just very simple, robust, um, reliable equipment. You know, we're not going to put an adjustment piece in there when it's not needed. You know, you can walk up and figure out how it's working. It's just going to run reliably. All of our equipment's there, but uh, you know, I say Jeffrey's that simple, resilient piece of equipment that'll just keep running. Is it um, here? I'm just trying to bring this up here. I was trying to bring up a picture of the. Uh... So when you said, yeah, because. Um, can you just break down the I, I was trying to bring it up so I could I could ask a couple questions about it, but could you just break down what the Jeffrey Raider, um, wh what it does? It's the. So, I mean, uh, that's the brand. So we've uh, it's our, our hammer mill line um, and. You know, from a distance, it'll look like the same hammer mill, but there's actually about eight, include forest products, maybe like 10 configurations, depending on what you're doing. There's one that's, you know, in rubber shredding. We've got ones that are recycling, you know, used medical sharps. And then you get into mining, there's a flex tooth version that is a specially designed hammer and rotor assembly that can uh, run at lower speeds and take bigger material. Um, and you have general, we call it an AB hammer mill, but a very general, you know, run of the mill hammer mill that can, uh, uh, you know, everybody would recognize. Um, and then you start getting into the wood product side, you, you've got some more variations. So that's kind of the core. Uh, our vibratory feeder line is Jeffrey branded. We've got, uh, you know, there's three different ways of doing it. You can do electromagnetic, you can do, uh, you know, a tuned mechanical oscillation. That's just a, a weight that is tuned. And then uh, just twin motors, which are these big old shaker motors that just shakes the thing like crazy. So uh, um, we end up pairing a lot of feeding devices with our uh, equipments uh, as well. In, in, in the mining process, again, apologies for the layman question, but in <laughs> the mining process, if you're doing a, a new mine, how would, would a lot of times, would all three products be integrated in or does it really, really depend? Um, pretty often, especially if you're talking through uh, we get involved from the ore side and then depending on the mineral type you end up processing it and then you're working with some precipitate or uh you know maybe compacted material so if we're getting involved across the board uh, for sure you know we have impactors sizers jaw crushers up in the ore side maybe some roll crushers in a secondary tertiary operation then uh you know Cage factors, if you're getting really small on the ore, definitely if you're processing. And then uh, we've got vibratory feeders and maybe a hammer mill, uh, either as a primary or a sampling circuit involved as well. So I guess I didn't say the brands. I just hit all three uh, brands multiple times over. Yeah, I hope you, maybe you can have a chart for us we can bring up somewhere. <laughs> you can kind of see the whole system. Um, the I, I want to I jump out of that, uh, Matt, because there's... Um, a few years ago, I heard the term and I read it for about two minutes and then my, I glazed over and then I had to like completely rework my brain to try to understand it. So and I and I was reading through prepping for the show yesterday and I saw it kept coming up on your LinkedIn. Um, it was a, a lean, which I hadn't heard about, and then Six Sigma uh, methodologies. And so for anybody watching, bear with this, bear with us because it's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I want to I want to have that basic understanding of it, but it's interesting from your source because you're transitioning, uh, or it's transferring, I should say, from your own production into the customer's um, production. So I want to have the, the sort of that um, high level discussion about Six Sigma and how it integrates into both your company and in, and transfers to the customer. Yeah, so I mean, those terms have been around for a long time in the methodologies. Uh, to some degree, the Six Sigma, there's a deep 
let's call it a toolkit. That's really what it is. They're both toolkits to accomplish a certain outcome. You know, in terms of uh, Six Sigma, there's a deep statistical side of it, and there, some of it is just more problem solving. It's a structure to say, I have this problem. Um, these are some methodologies to go around solving it. Uh, lean is the same, but it's much more focused on elimination of waste and optimizing production. Um, and again, it, it's a toolkit. And then, you know, the training and the learning is around which tools work and which don't. So uh, automotive kind of started it. They're known, you know, Japan, but even uh, in the U.S., uh, I've really cut my teeth uh, with John Deere, who has been using it for decades on the heavy duty off highway type equipment. So really look at it differently. You're not making hundreds of thousands of units. You know, maybe we're making 10,000 all the way down to 500 of a configuration. And it really is a different mentality around them. And then uh, with our business, uh, you know, I'm certainly not the only one that we've got a lot of strength around these that we apply to our own production around. Uh, so waste elimination, a lot of people think, all right, you're just trying to cut jobs. It's really not the intent at all. It's a customer lean in the pure sense, eliminating waste. A customer's willing to pay for only a very small amount. Like they'll pay for you to torque that. They don't really want to pay for you to go wander around, find the bolts, you know, go find your torque wrench. That's all waste. It's, you know, mood is the term. But, uh, you know, a bunch of traveling around, reworking, you know, if we get something to our assembly area and then we're grinding to get it to fit, that's waste. Customer doesn't want to pay for that. Why didn't you get it right back in the weld cell? Uh, so that's, uh, that's how we use it in the plant. And what we do is use that mentality when we discuss with customers, a lot of times they're getting pushed the initiatives that are coming down from their corporate, uh, around optimizing productivity, it, it, things like Kaizen, you know, 5S, let's clean things up. Um, oh man, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, but those are just from that lean and that Six Sigma toolkit. So um, Six Sigma gets into, you know, if we want to make some improvements, what sample sizes do we need to really say, yes, I've made an improvement versus that might just be normal variation. Uh, when you start talking about the predictive analytics by measuring bearing temperatures or vibration, you know, then you start getting into, sorry if I'm just glazing everybody over right now, but I, I do love this stuff. So statistical process control is literally a methodology that if you're watching, you know, a trend line of bearing temperatures going around or vibration, it says, you know, five points in one direction that is statistically significant. Something's going on. You need to go and look at that. If um, you have three points above what has been a normal range of variation, that's significant. You need to go look at that. Um, so, uh, you know, in that sense, very directly, we're, we're involved customer. with the customers. Yeah. Um, from a higher sense, they're getting pushed for how do they eliminate waste, whether it be literal product waste. We have a bunch of fines that we have to either mitigate through, you know, tailings or um, it's a lower value product. Like, sure, we sell that, but not at all. I'd rather make more of this. The same toolkits can apply. Not all of it, but some of them, you know, we can directly, you know, work with our customers and utilize. Yeah, I, I, when you, you mentioned John Deere, and um, you know, and again, you know, companies like GE, they implemented it way, way back. They, they implemented, um, and and you said it was, it came strong out of Japan. Um, in your business, though, and you, you kind of touched on it, but I wanted to unpack it a little more. In your business, though, you're not producing a million of these loaders. So the system is different. Is it, is it more of a challenge? And it's interesting because you come from that John Deere world where they are producing a very, you know, you see the lineup, there's a hundred loaders lined right up, ready to go. That's the same system to produce each one. In your business, that must be another, is that why lean is such an important part? Uh, because Six Sigma is, is more based on that, um, like that, uh, what, what, that manufacturing process? Yeah, I mean, even lean is as well, to be honest, a lot of it's, you know, there's a few assumptions. Six Sigma, it's like it assumes you have a process that is normal and in control. Normal meaning literally, you know, that bell-shaped curve. Uh, and even to know that, you have to have a lot of data points, you know, 30 at a minimum, 100. And you're right, we, we never have that many data points in the traditional sense. Uh, lean is the same way. A lot of the methodology is designed around you know, repetitive work, standard work, all of which is very applicable. Um, but it's not 
standard work just means like this is exactly how the work is done and we're going to do it the same way because then we know we're going to get similar quality out the back ends. Um, we get into where we have a mix of skilled tradesmen. There's still a lot of craft and artistry. There always is in welding in general, but when you start building our equipment, um, sometimes it doesn't make sense. No, we just need to, you know, we have an apprenticeship program and there's a little bit of journeyman uh, training that goes on because you kind of just need to learn this craft. But wherever possible, we then try to tie in things like standard work that say, no, this is the way it needs to be done because it results in very consistent quality. Um, so it's just from internal, and then I'll talk about how it uh, applies to our customers internally. Uh, it really was a struggle because even though at John Deere, we had some low volume going here, I was talking to one of my former master black belts, you know, one of the terms used, uh, I was like, man, we don't make anything. He's like, well, how many holes do you drill? You know, on that piece of machine, I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, we're drilling hundreds and thousands of holes. So you start looking at repeatability within your work centers um, rather than that one particular type of equipment, you're, you're driving efficiency and improvement within your work centers and work cells uh, a little differently. And that's kind of what it applies to our, our, our customers. You know, you have the added complexity that you're dealing with stuff from the earth, which is just never consistent. You know, that is one thing that is almost guaranteed. If you're in a, you know, a general industrial facility, like it's consistent product type going in. You're in a mine, that mine phase progresses, all of a sudden your ore changes. And, you know, we end up getting into a lot of conversation with customers around how they deal with that. You know, it's, it's not behaving the same, it's harder. Um, yeah, it, it's fun. Uh, it definitely presents a challenge and some of those tools you just throw out the window because they don't apply at all. It's, and I wanna, I, I, think, I think maybe actually I do have it wrong, but I'm gonna take a swing at it. But what you're saying a little bit though is in the production, you can't look at it as a grand scale as if you're, let's say there's a semi truck getting assembled down the line. You almost have to just, you can't go for that goal because almost it's never a goal that's gonna be reached because there's so much variation in the end product. So you have to find you have to find little pockets within that production that you can create consistency. Is that is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, and I think if you're you know at a, a mining facility, it'd be the same thing. You know, you've got a bunch of you know different pieces of equipment along a singular value chain. You know, you look at more. All right, here I'm going to draw boundaries around this area that seems to be a constraint. You know, we had a a mine that's you know, was constrained in terms of their capacity around uh, just the recirculation loop. And, you know, we actually took out one of our cage factors and put in a nano sizer that didn't have to just is able to produce the finished product at such a high rate that all of a sudden um, that they increased the capacity of the plant by 10% just because of the reduced amount of recirculation. So you can kind of say, all right, I'm going to focus on this area and you, uh, the customer brings in their own expertise. They bring in, you know, the OEMs, and have, you know, Kaizen is just a name for kind of a focused event where you evaluate the process and within a short time frame make very targeted improvements. Um, you know, we've started doing that a little with our customers um, to have kind of a, a, a joint effort to drive some improvements. It's actually something, Joe, sort of as we get to the tail end of this interview, I, and I wanted to, um, those upgrades, like you just mentioned, doing that, is that, um, how often are you doing that? Because you have all these units out, out in the field operating. How often are you actually reaching out to a customer and saying, hey, we just, we, we've, we've upgraded this system, um, which is going to work for you. I mean, that must, for one, that's a lot of data to know that, to be able to reach out to all these customers. But are you able to, to do that um, or successfully do that? Uh, yeah. Um, some of it's just proactive. We, we have a pretty... Um, robust sales channels. So like we stay very connected with our customers. I'd say that's something that we do a lot more than a lot of others in terms of actually getting in and being on site with our customers fairly often. But we also, uh, we use Salesforce as a CRM, um, but we have our install base in there. So we've got, oh man, I think 15,000 active assets that we capture all that data. And every time a customer calls, it gets logged against that unit. You know, that customer is tied to it their accounts tied to it, we know the sales, so we can get an idea of you know, how long that's been out there. And then when we come up with some advancements, like uh, we just recently redesigned the cages for our cage factor to be modular and use some more advanced materials, change the striking plate geometry. Um, 
we, we know all the customers that have been engaged and are associated with cage factors. And so we kind of communicate out to them in a campaign and literally just yesterday, I think, and, you know, immediately like thousand people open it up and look at it. And I think we had, you know, like five people reach out to, you know, their sales guys that day say, Hey, tell me more about this. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, yeah. I've, I've kind of wondered how that would system, because obviously, you know, 10 years, you say this equipment sometimes is around for 20 years or more. I, I mean, uh, we, we had an oldest equipment contest over the summer. Or it was a little bit before that. I think the longest one's like 80 something years still running. And then we actually knew of one longer, but they just didn't turn it in. So uh, yeah, no, it, it creates its own challenges when you have equipment that when it comes to how you design it, like literally welding wasn't in widespread use. So it's all castings and maybe some rivets and they're like, all right, well, we can redesign that to make it much more efficient, you know, more robust. So did the winner get a new machine? Is that? <laughs> no, I think they just got some nice swag from uh, our marketing guy. Um, Oh, I, I come from the, the Savannah equipment background, so I could probably find some of your old units out there. Um, uh, okay, last thing I wanted to ask. You, you mentioned training for the, do you have, does TerraSource have, uh, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, because it's not my notes, but do you have a training program for some of these um, to sort of bring up the next generation? Is, it, is there anything in place for that while you're, you're producing? Yeah, it? I'd say the ro most robust. And again, uh, we talked to, uh, you know, I mentioned Georgia Pacific, you talk to people there, um, any of the major um, names uh, are struggling with skilled labor and they're saying, hey, like we want to partner with you to literally like just hand it off. Like, you know, you've got that skilled knowledge around it, you maintain it and you can service it or, uh, you know, we need to pair with them as they bring in new leadership. Like I said, we have the institutional type tribal knowledge of that specific facility of you know, in some cases, just that overall parent company, we know that, you know, at these two mines, they do it this way and it's working out really well. Did you know they did that? You should go talk to them. Like it's working great. Um, we have the same challenges internally. You know, we we're machining, we're welding, we're assembling heavy equipment and uh, it's been a struggle for us. So we literally just created an apprenticeship program um, that we're just, um, we're on the department of labor's website for its, um, because of how successful it's been uh, partnering with a local community college where they get international accreditation. So uh, that's kind of been our skilled trades within our own manufacturing facility and engineering there. Uh, you know, we've got a specific training plan as people, you know, are able to take on uh, additional work uh, really right now. We've, we're trying to build out even the sales side of it. You know, how do we have some good targeted technical training uh, built in more structured uh, as well. I think it's essential. You're going to have to bring in new people. Things evolve at such a rate now. You almost just need that structure so you can feed it in. Um, because even a, somebody that's a pro, uh, they now, as we introduce new products, they just need a conduit and a good structure in terms of how to learn that and then be able to go and support our customers around it. Yeah, it's, um, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about the next generation. Um, so it's always interesting when it's, how would I say it? You, we talk to a lot of organizations, so it's a little bit surface, right? It's, yep. it's not, okay, you actually taught the person to pull the lever here and to then make this adjustment and then read that data. Like it's, it's on the ground. I, I would love at some point to, to have a better understanding of that training program because I think, you know, things like Six Sigma, um, you know, uh, uh, the training programs for people coming into the industry, these types of things, again, I think it so often gets covered at a high surface so and where that i think where that actually can hurt the industry sometimes is that let's say these smaller operators they don't get to sort of see oh this is how it gets done so they get to go oh, okay this big giant company is doing it they got to throw a million dollars but there's not this little they're missing out on this little pocket so every time every time they make that movement or change that tool or whatever they miss out on that opportunity so i hope at some point we can actually unpack it a little bit more so that some of our, you know, smaller operators can actually. That'd be great. I mean, I, I do love, I could talk about it all day long. Know, and you're right. A lot of the small operators, you know, they end up missing out. But also some of the small operators where you get a couple key individuals that know this stuff, like they end up implementing it the best because there's just less constraints. There's more cohesion uh, because, uh, you know, all the ownership and the management is right there and bought in. Uh, that's a key thing. Lean, Six Sigma. One of the biggest thing is, you know, from the very top upper level management buy-in 
and bought in. And it really, they stress that inverted pyramid where management is really there to support. The only guy that's customer case cares to pay is the guy that's welding, machining. We're all overhead behind that, trying to, you know, help him do his job better. Um, so yeah, I've seen some really awesome implementations at some of the small operations. If you just get a, you know, skill up a few individuals. Yeah, I kind of threw the Six Sigma on you um, at the the sort of this morning, actually, because I saw it so much in your bio. So uh, if you, you know, coming on again, I, I would love to unpack some of those examples and it would be a very interesting thing and very educational. So I'd love to. Matt, thanks for coming on the show. I uh, I love this stuff. I love heavy equipment, you know, and, and it's it's nice for you because you're sort of on that front line, but you're also an engineer. So you understand it's, it's always an interesting conversation when we can sort of unpack it from a kind of high level than right on the ground. So thanks for coming on the show. I, I really do hope to have you back on. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for watching, everyone. Um, uh, I just said it, but I'll say it again. I love those types of episodes. I love when it starts with the heavy equipment and then moves up into the technology I'm not knocking our people that come on the show that start from the technology side, but I just, I just have a bias against it. I like it. So thank you, uh, Matt, for coming in TerraSource. Um, everybody, uh, you, Gaudi will sign off on the end to tell you where you can follow us. But I'm going to ask you on the show, please keep suggesting guests. You notice as you watch the Crownsman Show, Mining Now, Crownsman Energy, the array of guests we're getting, the reason we're getting them is because people are bringing them in from completely different industries and different sources. So it's what makes it interesting, what makes it valuable to you. So please keep suggesting, keep on following us. Thank you for watching. Thank you to CIM for partnering with, with us on Mining Now, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Also, if you would like to be part of the show, whether it's Mining Now, uh, The Crownsman Show, or Crownsman Energy, please contact us, info at crownsman.com. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you to TerraSource Global for joining us today. We will see you on the next episode.